Dr. Stanish, tell me, do, do you recognize this fella? It's kind of like a dean I had once. A dean that you had in <laughs> school, sure. Tell me, though, who is this? Who is this? This is Homo habilis. Homo habilis. And people say that he's one of my great, 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 great grandfathers. Is that true? That's the theory. That's the theory. Well, you know what? In a moment, we're just going to dig into the ground and find out how much we really know about these monkey men that we're digging out of the ground. So stick around for Out of Thin Air. Good evening, and again, I want to welcome you to the special presentation by Sean Boonstra of It Is Written Television called Out of Thin Air. You know, tonight, Sean is going to take you on a journey. He's going to take from Scripture right through the mind of God, where in the mind of God, he began to think about creation, and you see how in the Word of God, he actually took the thought of God, began to put it into words, and as the words came out of his mouth, our world materialized. All the beauty that you see around us comes from the thought of God translated into words that come into reality. And here's the incredible thing I want you to think about for a moment. Where do you fit into that? In God's creative scheme, where do you fit, fit into that? Tonight I think you're going to find out that you are the crowning act of God's creation. Have you ever thought about that? How important you can be in this whole scheme? He made the human being as the crowning act of his creation. Tonight's presentation is the hidden history of the human race. Would you please welcome Sean Boonstra. Thank you for being here again. We're going to look at an awful lot in a very short time again tonight. We're not going to be able to cover everything that I'd love to cover in just the few moments we have together, or even in the four nights that we have together. But again, I want to lay that important foundation that lets you start asking the right questions so that you start arriving at some real answers. And again, because I am a minister and a Christian and I believe that God does exist, last night I talked about why I think He exists and how I know He exists, how something started this place, I always like to speak to Him just before I speak. So let's bow our heads for a moment. Father in Heaven, thank You for loving us and thank You for giving us intelligent minds that can examine evidence and come to conclusions. It's my prayer tonight that You would bless what I say so that Lord, tonight what I say is intelligent and helps us to discover you, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I begin our subject tonight, the hidden history of the human race, I want to really, really, really quickly review what we talked about in meeting number one. You see, it's going to prove to be important to review this information a lot and do a lot of thinking because there is no way we can cover the biggest questions in the universe in only four nights. It's important to really make sure then that what we do discuss, we really have nailed down. So let's do a super quick review of what we've already talked about. At our first meeting, we noticed that up until about 150 years ago, people just kind of assumed that God put us here. We thought that something or someone had a purpose for us here on planet Earth. We were put here on purpose by design and our lives actually mean something. And we got that from places like the book of Revelation chapter 4 which says we were created for God's pleasure and we had a design, a purpose, a reason for being here. But then about 150 years ago, not quite, Darwin puts out this book called The Origin of Species and he starts talking about the fact that maybe we came into being all by ourselves and God's no longer in the picture. He came up with this theory known as natural selection. He said animals change over time and the best traits survive and one of the animals that he looked at were the finches. He said the ones with the long beaks survive better than the ones with the short beaks and the short beaked birds die off and the long beaked birds survive and so they have lots of long beaked babies. Remember that? Do you, re do you remember it at all? All right. Long beaked babies. So long beaks become the dominant trait, said Darwin. 
But as we looked at Darwin last night, we noticed that he left some pretty big questions unanswered. He made observations about the way living organisms are and how things might change, but he doesn't answer the really big questions. Stuff like, why am I here? How did life start? And why do I have this sense that I'm supposed to be doing something with the time that I have here on Earth? Why is it a, a sorrow to me when I'm wasting time, when I look back over my life and I can see entire years that didn't count for anything, like my third year in university when I hardly ever went to class? And if my mom ever sees this, that's actually what happened. <laughs> Why do we think life has to mean something? Darwin came up with this theory as a way of explaining life without God in the picture. We know now, historically speaking, that Darwin wanted God out of the picture. He spoke often about books like the Bible and said, if only we could get rid of that stuff. And, and interestingly enough, he was a theologian. He's even, I believe, the son of a minister. He, he thought about such things. He wanted God out of the picture, and he needed a theory that got rid of God. It was deliberate. He wanted God out of the picture. And we discovered last night that there are a lot of people who, after studying things carefully, can see that God must exist, or at least something started it, and something put it in motion, or somebody put it in motion, but they don't want God in the picture. They just say, okay, we know that life can't come into being by itself, but we have to accept that if we don't want God in the picture, so we're just going to accept that life can come into being by itself. It's still going on today. People still say stuff like that, like Professor Richard Lewinton, the, the uh, scientist. He said... We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs. What does that mean? We know that some things, some of the scientific conclusions we come to are just dead wrong. But we still side with that because we have a prior commitment. Now, that's very honest. We have an agenda. There's something we want to prove. We have a commitment to materialism. Moreover, that materialism is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. In other words... What he's saying is we only have bad evidence for life just coming into being by itself and some of these theories that we hold to, the evidence is really, really bad. But we only have two options. Either somebody or something put this all in motion or it came into being by itself. And we don't want this one where somebody put it into motion. We don't want there to be a God, so we have to go with it came into being by itself even if the evidence says that's wrong very honest of him to say that. So now here's the problem. If you take God right out of the picture, you just ignore the fact. I mean, we saw in our first meeting that everything always comes back to the fact somebody or something had to start this all. If you just ignore that, how do you explain where you and I come from? How do you explain that? Well, my Time magazine had an answer the other day. I was reading Time magazine. It comes in the mail, and on the cover it said, How We Became Human. I was flipping through it. It told us many of the same stories. We share common ancestors with the monkeys. It doesn't say we came from monkeys. It, this article said, well, we share common ancestors with monkeys and great apes and so on. Way back when, we kind of split paths, and some became chimpanzees, and some became humans. And what they're saying now is that we are, genetically speaking, 98% chimpanzee. We share 98% of our genetic material. So obviously we come from a common ancestor. We have the same great, 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 grandfather. At some point, chimpanzees and so on split. Now, I've been wondering, what does it mean when somebody says, I'm 98% chimpanzee? I...